I'm going to ask you to join me in Zephaniah chapter 3. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that in a church service before. Turn to Zephaniah. Did you even know there was a Zephaniah in the Bible? I think that I, I was thinking about it earlier, like, you know, I'm really proud of Jackson, the name that we chose for our son. Nice, strong name. But man, this is my son, Zephaniah. Like, there's got a nice ring to that. So any of you that are ex uh, expecting or expecting in the future, I think we need to bring Zephaniah back uh, in the boy's names. And who did you, no one's a boy no, named Zephaniah. It's unique. There's not going to be one more Zephaniah on the playground. So let's make it happen, parents. Um, so if you are using one of the Bibles in the pew, uh, this is we're going to be looking at Zephaniah chapter 3 uh, on the pew Bible. It's on page 790, or click, uh, click to that wherever you might be. Uh, those who are at home, uh, just to let you know, we put this in the email this week, uh, but just to remind you if you didn't see that, we are going to be doing communion at the end of service, and so just to be aware that that is happening. Um, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this. God, I thank you so much uh, for your love for us. We thank you for uh, what you are doing in this place, your presence here, God, how you are working in our lives, how you're showing us uh, your grace and your mercy. Uh, how you care for us and protect us. And so, God, I pray that you would just make us aware of who you are, of your immense love for us this morning. Help us to find joy in who you are. And so you know what everything that we're going through, you know everything we're processing, you know the ins and outs of all of it, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Help us to know that you care and that you're here. We love you for it. Pray you speak to us through your word. Spirit, move in this place for all those who are hearing. In your name, amen. I want you to think for a moment of your reaction when you have tasted something so absolutely delicious it blew your mind. I'm talking about that meal or that dish or that dessert or whatever it was when it's just so good that you have that closed eyes, slowly chewing, just letting it savor, kind of like the audible noises of, mm, that is so good. Like, have you had that kind of, I'm not talking, you're not getting that at McDonald's. Like, I'm talking about some, that kind of a meal, though, where you're just like, oh, who, who's had that? Who knows what I, you're thinking, now, now you, your hand went up. I want you to think through, though, the specific thing that you tasted. That specific meal, that th maybe it was something at home that mom or dad would make when you were growing up, or maybe something you had at some specific restaurant, but wherever it's from, it's the meal, something that you would crave again. It's something that you would compare other meals to. That if you had the same kind of thing somewhere else, you'd be like, oh, no, no, no. Let me tell you about what I had, you know, that kind of a thing. Are you tracking with me about this type of an idea? For me, a f is the, the meal I think of, a few years after Jeanette and I got married, we went back to the place where our reception was to eat at the restaurant that they had there. And it's a Brazilian steakhouse type of a place. And I can sincerely say that it is one of the best meals that I have had in my entire life. I don't know how they cooked their chicken, but there was something magical about it and unworldly. It was just phenomenal. And I remember just going, oh, how did they do this? Like, so, so good. You've had a meal like that. One that you keep talking about the experience and one that you also would long and hunger for again. I'm really, really sorry if I'm making you hungry again. We have hospitality out again, though, and those lovely snacks will not compare to what you're thinking of, but they'll help. Now, today's sermon is not about food, but it does relate, this idea of what I've put you through, relates to what we do want to talk about today, and that's joy. Joy. Joy is an emo emotional term. In its most basic sense, it's a state of delight or well-being. Synonyms we might think of are gladness or elation, and those begin to get at it. Other words that might come to mind are happiness or pleasure, but those definitely are not the same thing as joy. Author Frederick Buchner, he does a great job contrasting the idea of happiness and joy, and he says this, Happiness is a man-made, happiness is man-made, a happy home, a happy marriage, a happy relationship with our friends and within our jobs. We work 
for these things. And if we are careful and wise and lucky, we can usually achieve them. Happiness is one of the highest achievements of which we are capable. And when it is ours, we we take credit for it, and properly so. And really, this is the goal of our our culture puts out. Do what you can, work hard to get what you need to be happy. Work for it. But then Bookner also says this. We never take credit for our moments of joy because we know that they are not man-made and that we are never really responsible for them. They come when they come. They are always sudden and quick and unrepeatable, the unspeakable joy sometimes of just being alive. And this is where joy is different. We cannot create joy. Its source is from outside of us out of our control. It's not based on our circumstances. Joy is not based on things going our way because joy will show up when our circumstances aren't as we want them to be. And joy will show up even when we don't have control. Buchner says joy is a mystery because it can happen anywhere, anytime, even under the most uncompromising circumstances, even in the midst of suffering, with tears in its eye, even nailed to a tree. Joy is deeper and greater than our circumstances, so much so that not only does it have the ability to, but the audacity to show up, even during our darkest times. Like the meal that I mentioned, joy is something that we can both experience, but also long for. In his autobiographical work, C.S. Lewis defines joy as the experience of an unsatisfied desire, which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. Uh, Somebody writing about Lewis's life, Clive Kirby, he paraphrases Lewis's point by saying, joy is a desire which no natural happiness can ever satisfy. Joy is the lifelong pointer toward heaven. It is something outside of ourselves. It's rooted in the reality of the Lord. It is something that penetrates even our darkest of days, our confusion, whatever it might be. It fills us with something only God can give. This is what Isaiah is talking about when he says, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Joy. And so as we've been looking at the different Old Testament prophets, I've really, I don't know about anybody else, but I've really enjoyed looking at these little books and these little messages in the Old Testament and the words that these prophets spoke to Israel. And we've been looking at specifically what they've said about Messiah to come, the arrival of Jesus amongst us. And in the midst of his writing, Zephaniah's message speaks specifically about how we can find joy in the Lord. And the first thing he tells us is that we can find joy in God's grace. We can find joy in God's grace. He says in verse 14, we're going to look at uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to the end. He says, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. Now, you hear this, and it sounds like a call to worship. It's almost like our team, when service starts, like, all right, everybody, let's stand up. Let's get ready for worship. Let's worship the Lord. And that's what it sounds like, because reality, it is. But we have to understand the context of this. This isn't Zephaniah saying this in a nice church building where everybody came in ready to go and with their coffee and happy and kind of warming up a little bit from the cold. There's a different context here. This section of the book where we're coming, looking at right now comes after two and a half chapters of Zephaniah calling out the people for their idolatry, worshiping things not, who aren't the Lord for their not pursuing the Lord, for their complacency, for for their pride and their rebellion. He's been calling them out for all of these things and pointing to the reality of the consequences of these sins with vivid descriptions given for how Israel, how their sins have brought these consequences 
this destruction and suffering on themselves. We cannot read the paragraph we're looking at today, chapter 3, verses 14 and 20, separate than the whole rest of the book before it. Their own actions have created a joyless existence. Humanity's actions have created a joyless existence. Going against who God is, away from his best, ignoring what he calls people to, creates brokenness. The Bible calls those acts sin. Sometimes the brokenness is caused by our decisions, the things that we decide to do. Sometimes the brokenness is caused, we get caught up in the consequences of other people's decisions. And sometimes it's the brokenness is there because creation is broken. Zephaniah tells us that God does not want people to remain in brokenness. Into the midst of their reality, God offers grace and restoration. Grace, he says, your punishment will be taken away. Restoration, he says, I will turn back your enemy. God will change their joyless experience into one defined by joy, where they can sing and rejoice. David, one of the kings of Israel before this, way before Zephaniah, he sings about this in one of his psalms in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David confessing some horrible sins that he did. And in the midst of that chapter, he says this, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. David is saying, God, because of you, you, your forgiveness, your grace, I can know joy instead of shame. I can know joy and forgiveness instead of brokenness caused by my sin. Because of the grace of God, because of his love for us and his pursuit of us, we can know joy with him. Eugene Peterson says this, Joy is not a requirement of Christian discipleship. It is a consequence. It is not what we have to acquire in order to experience life in Christ. It is what comes to us when we are walking in the way of faith and obedience. When we experience grace, when we trust in who Jesus is, the benefit of that is joy. This is what Jesus makes possible. He says in, he says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is nothing that we've done that God will not forgive. It says in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are saved through Jesus' work on the cross, through the grace given to us by God. Not by how good of a person we are, not by how much better of a person we are, not based on what our parents have done, not based on any checklist of anything like that. We find grace in Jesus. Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man who, against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. We must acknowledge and mourn the reality of our sin, but we turn those and take those to Jesus and we find forgiveness and restoration. To, live, to have an existence, an identity of no shame, to have an identity of no guilt, to have an identity of a clean heart, a renewed spirit, a new life. Jesus offers us that. Find joy in God's grace. The second thing Zephaniah tells us is that we can find joy in God's presence. We can find joy in his presence. It says, 
in verse, the second half of verse 15, it says, The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Now, that first phrase in this entire paragraph is where it's at. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Not, I hope to see you someday. Not, come back and visit. Not, hey, we should hang out. Not, watching from a distance. Not, you have to quarantine for 10 days and then I'll see you. The Lord is with you present and what does it say when we are in the presence of god when we are in the presence of the saving warrior when we're in the presence of the one who takes delight in us he removes fear the presence of god is a no fear zone don't be afraid he tells us now i know that's easier said than done sometimes but at times when we get to that dejected place, when we get to that defeated stance, what happens to us? Our arms hang limp. That's what, that's what happens, right? Think about your body. Think about when you're discouraged. Think about when you're defeated. Think about when you feel hopeless. We have physically, we just, right? It just, it's, it's the slouch, the arms, it's just, and what God is saying in the presence of God, you can stand up straight. Your arms don't need to hang limp. In fact, that's one of the reasons why if you're new to church, you're new to this Jesus thing, and you come into communities of faith and people have their hands up is because they don't have to hang limp. Because they're just so joyous and so worshipful of who God is that we want to acknowledge that reality. Make sure to focus on the Lord who is with you more than the situation that you're in. Because typically that's what happens. Our eyes get so focused on the situation, so focused on the circumstance, so focused on the difficulty that we forget who is with us in the midst of them. That isn't to water down or minimize the difficulty. It's not to say don't feel the difficulty or the negative emotions or any of those things. It's just saying that while all that's going on, remember that God is with you. While all the junk is going on, the difficulty is going on, the pain is going on, within all of that, remember that God is with you. And remember that, because even if you're like, well, I just want him to leave me alone, he's never going to do that. He is the persistent, pursuing God who is going to chase you down because he does not want you to be alone. He does not want you to know brokenness. He does not want your arms to hang limp. He does not want you to be discouraged and fearful. He loves you more than you can comprehend. And the thing that we have to re realize, and this is one of those passages in Scripture that I feel sometimes, I think people forget this, or maybe don't even know it, but it says that God takes delight in us. God takes delight in us. And that second part of that, what we just read, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The Lord gets excited about being with you, is ecstatic to be with you. And anybody that has a problem with that theologically needs to look at Scripture, because I'm just reading what the Bible says. The Lord takes delight in us. Really, the picture here of God taking delight in us, rejoice, think about it, God singing over us. Now, anybody that knows me, I, I have a lot of talents, I have a lot of hobbies, I'm good at a few things, but singing is by far not one of them. You do not want to stand next to me during worship. But the voice of God singing 
because of the joy he experiences with you whom he loves. We can't, we can't miss that. It's really, when I think about that verse, this is an Old Testament picture of how we see the father at the end of the New Testament story about the prodigal son. Because at the prodigal son, he, dad, I want my inheritance. Give me everything that I deserve. He runs off. He parties. He lives his life on his own. And it leads him to just a dejected in the gutter place. His, his life is as low as it possibly can get. And he says, maybe, maybe my father will hire me. Not, I want to go see my dad, or I want, I, maybe if anybody's going to, no one will hire me, maybe my dad will hire me, and I can start crawling out of this pit. But it says in Luke that as the son came home and came to the father, it says, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for the son, this my son for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate the ce- father celebrates because the son who was lost and dead is now found and alive The father in the parable wants to celebrate. Zephaniah tells us God rejoices over us with singing. God singing, not worshiping us, but finding joy in us. What are you going through this morning? Dealing with, processing. You are not alone. What noise is going on in your life that seems hopeless and confusing? Know that God is singing over you. His grace, his love, his care for you. What makes you feel dejected, rejected, unwanted? Lift up your arms in praise because God is with you, loves you, wants you, cares for you. You are not alone. And maybe that's why you came this morning. Whether you came of your own volition or were dragged here, maybe because you were wide awake or you're still waking up, regardless of why you're here, maybe this is the thing you needed to hear this morning. Is that whatever the thing is that you're going through, as difficult as it might be, as confusing as it might be, as hard as it might be, know that you are not alone and turn to God seek comfort in him not in other things or other people because he is the only one that can truly care for you and tend to your heart find joy in God's presence and then the last thing Zephaniah tells us is find joy in God's promises find joy in God's promises Remember, the joy of the Lord is something we experience, but it's also something we anticipate. It's something we taste, and it's like, oh, this is so good. But then we want it again. We experience the joy of salvation. We experience the joy of his presence. He takes the initiative. He makes it possible, but his work is not done. And Zephaniah communicates what God will continue to do. The God that he is, and the God that he is says this, I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you, and at that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. Now, before we get to the good part of this section, we have to acknowledge one thing. The promises of God and the love of God do not mean that life will not bring hard times and suffering. He's given people the ability to choose, to make choices of their free will and since the beginning that choice is often to move away from God rather than toward him 
And remember, to move away from God causes brokenness, ultimately. It may be our choice, it may be the choice of another, like I said, or the choice from the beginning, which broke creation. But however it came about, this life will have mourning, burdens, oppression, sickness, exile, shame. That life will bring these things. Well, why did God allow that? Because he gave us the choice to choose him or to reject him. And there are consequences. There's a reality to rejecting him. That's the path. The rejection path leads to these things. And so we just have to not be shocked at what, by the fact that life brings these experiences. Because God never told us that life would be absent of them. But thankfully, the promise-keeping God declares what he is going to do even in the midst of them. He'll remove burdens. He'll deal with oppressors. He'll rescue. He'll gather exiles. He will bring us home, he says. And this is a, from the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament. This is the promise of God. The Bible ends with a similar promise. It says at the end of Revelation, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. This is what God has promised is going to happen. We experience his presence we experience his grace, and we experience this promised reality of who he is and what he's doing. These promises of God, this promised conclusion, these are the truths we have to cling to and find hope in. They give us perspective and comfort and hope in what's to come. Knowing what God is doing and will do helps us navigate these difficulties as we wait for their fulfillment. In the midst of a season that feels like exile, whether brought on by ourselves or others, we navigate by pursuing our promise-keeping God. He tells us clearly who he is so that we can seek him and follow him and find comfort in him. And so that's the question then. Who are you looking to? What is your what is the Lord of your heart? Because everybody is worshiping something. And so who are you looking to with your heart for life, for meaning, for purpose, for joy in this world? Because nothing else can make the kind of claim that God can. God says, I'm going to do these things. This is what's going to happen. No one else can offer what he does. And even if someone tries, only he can pull it off. And so what are you looking to? Because I guarantee it doesn't compare. I guarantee it can't give you what God can. Do not settle for a quick fix in the moment that is all but going to guarantee eventual disappointment. When God offers you joy in the present and a joyous future, in eternity. No one can give you what he can. Trust in the promise-keeping God. Let him be your life. Experience him and anticipate him living and finding true joy. We can find joy in, the, in God's promises, in his presence, in his grace. And I pray that that's true for you today, that you know him. And if you don't, let today be the day where you truly experience joy, where you acknowledge your need for Jesus, and you acknowledge that he isn't just some old teacher who is really smart and helps some people, but that he was God on earth, 
that he lived a perfect life and he went to the cross to die for our sin. For our brokenness, for our sin, for our wrongdoings, he took all of that on him on the cross so that he could put what's good and righteous about him onto us and give us a new identity. He conquered sin. He conquered death in his resurrection. And he says, come into this life. Be part of my kingdom. Be part of my family. Let me give you a new name. Let me give you a new identity. Let me give you joy. You just have to trust him. You have to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. There's no form to fill out. You don't have to come to me to do it. You're just in the quietness of your heart. Make that commitment and give your life to him. And I pray you do that today, whether you're here or you're at home listening. I pray today is the day that you find joy. We're going to end our service by receiving communion. Um, and so if you're in here, uh, if you're at home and you want to grab different elements, if you're here with us, and you don't have communion stuff, can you just raise your hand, and Alexander's going to bring some by. Uh, if this is your first time doing communion with us uh, on site, uh, these delicious little things have two flaps on them. The clear flap will get you to the cracker, and the silver flap will get you to the juice, but just hold off on opening that for one moment. We always take a minute just to be in the presence of the Lord and hear from him and pray before we receive communion. Communion is about a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. His, the bread represents his broken body. The juice represents um, his shed blood. Broken and shed in our place so that we can know life. And so, if, again, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, you don't need, trust in him, you don't need to do, be doing communion. You need to begin that life. For those of you who have uh, are in a relationship with God, this is a moment of being before him to remember all that he's done. And so maybe you just need to be quiet in his presence and be reminded of his, the joy that he gives. Maybe you need to confess something to him. Maybe you want to ask, pray for guidance or pray for joy in whatever you're experiencing. Well, let's just take a minute together and then we'll receive communion. And so God, I pray you would speak to us now in the quiet of this moment. We want to hear from you. Let's be quiet before him. receive communion, I'm going to light the uh, Advent candle for this week. And we've been, the first week of Advent, we talked about hope. That the, the scene we find our lives in right now is not the end of our story. And really, reading that section of Revelation today, we know what our future is if you have a relationship with Jesus. And so regardless of anything we're going through, there's more than this, and we have hope for the future. Last week, we, we talked about peace, the fact that God is in control, the fact that God is sovereign, the fact that God is powerful, the fact that God is present with us. And because of that, we can find a sense of peace and live within the reality that he's in control. And then today we talk about joy. And really, even though we talk about these individually, it's hard to separate them because they're so interconnected and interwoven. 
When we think about joy, though, Psalms 30 says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. It says in Isaiah 51 again, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Why can we sing? Why can they dance? Because they know who the Lord is. Because they know what Jesus has done. And even though they might be weeping because of the difficulty of what they're going through, at the same time, joy overtakes us because of who Jesus is. And I am telling you, if you are not looking to Jesus for joy, it is the same thing. I mean, I made a joke about we have hospitality and some great snacks out there, and it doesn't compare to the meal that you were thinking about earlier, but that's exactly what happens when it comes to Jesus when we find joy in other things. We are willing to accept snacks when that amazing meal of grace is available to us. You need to receive what Jesus is offering you. He says in John, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve and your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away. That's the joy that Jesus offers us because of his work on the cross. Let's stand together and receive communion. Jesus, we are grateful for who we are. We are grateful for your love for us. We are grateful that you, turn, you bring singing into mourning. We thank, thankful, God, that you bring gladness into where tears are also at. That you fill us with who you are and what you've done. God, we are grateful for your love for us at the cross. For all that you've gone through for us. We're grateful for the life which you've given. God, forgive us for the times when we look to lesser things. To things that in no way can compare to you. God, fill us with joy an awareness of who we are as your children, as part of the redeemed, part of your kingdom, part of the forgiven. God, we just thank you for who you are, and we thank you for all you've done. We do this in remembrance of you. Let's receive communion together. We're grateful for your broken body. We're grateful for your shed blood, the cross and the empty tomb, and the life we receive because of it. In your name, amen. Just hold on to these, and there's a garbage can in the back, and you can just throw it uh, in there on your way out. But as we think about all that God is and all that he's done, let's just worship him and praise him 